through what it means to trust and obey, and then to think through the song that says, ancient words forever true, changing me and changing you. See, we're, we're deep into our study of worship here this morning. And sometimes I think we can sing songs without really stopping to think through those songs. So this morning, I want to ask you some questions to kind of prime the pump. Hopefully you all know what prime the pump means. Some of you might not. If not, you can go home and Google it. You can find out what it means. But we want to prime the pump to get us thinking here this morning. I'm not going to ask anyone to raise your hand if this is true of you, but I want you to deal honestly with yourself and with God as we ask these questions to get us thinking about what we're going to look at here this morning. Why did you come to Open Door Bible Church this morning? Whether you articulate it or not, when you walk in those doors, and when you walk into the worship center here this morning, you have an expectation. You have an expectation. You may not have articulated it, but you expect to get something out of worship. What is your typical response if your expectations are not met? Why today? Why did you come today? You know, we worship, by and large, 52 weeks out of the year. Right? Sometimes we might take a Sunday off because of weather or something like that. But we meet, we gather every Sunday of every month. I just want to share something with you that you know, it really kind of should, should get our wheels turning a little bit. Just this past Sunday, and, and I know that there are things that, that factor into why somebody might be here on one particular Sunday versus the next. But the first Sunday of this month, and this, these numbers include children, okay? So, so this is total amount of people that were here on campus that we were ministering to in some way. The first Sunday of this month, we had 143 people. The next Sunday, we dropped to 116. The next Sunday, which was last week, we had 133. I don't know how many are in here today, but if you trace the history and you go back over 2023, every month, the first Sunday of the month is the most well-attended Sunday of the month. For what reason? Beyond Communion, right? We do communion. But let's face it. We like to eat, don't we? Right? We like to eat. And so we feed ourselves here on the Word, and then we go and we feed ourselves over there. But you know, we do, besides communion and the fellowship dinner, we still focus on the Word every Sunday. We still sing songs to our God every Sunday. What is it about this Sunday that brings you here? What is it about the other Sundays that keeps you away? Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just asking questions to prime the pump. When the musicians play and the vocalists sing and the sermon is preached, do you see those as ends of themselves? In other words, do you see those as integral parts of worship or could you truly worship if we decided to eliminate one of them? Which one of those would you eliminate? Would you eliminate music? Or would you eliminate the preaching? See, in some churches, the view of music is that it is too corrupted by the culture, so they eliminate it altogether. That's just gone. All right? In some other churches, music is often the dominant wheel of what happens in corporate worship. And there's so much focus on that that if they don't have time for the message, that's okay. And then this question. Do you intentionally prepare your heart for worship on Sunday morning? When you're getting dressed, when you're getting in your car, and you're proceeding here on Sunday, is your heart eager to worship God or do you have something else on your mind? Well, hopefully I haven't ticked you off. Right? Hopefully I haven't made you mad by asking you those questions. And hopefully we've primed the pump to, to really get us to hear what God 
is about to say to us in our understanding of worship. If you're new with us, we've been walking through over the last few weeks, we've been walking through Scripture that, that really focuses our heart on what it means to have a life of praise. Authentic worship. That's what we're talking about. So I invite you to take your Bibles and open to John chapter 4. A wonderful passage of Scripture. The word worship, in the text we're going to look at here this morning, the word worship appears in some form ten times in this passage. And one of the rules of Bible interpretation is if there's a word or phrase that appears more than once, that's probably pretty important for us to look at. So we want to understand what this text is saying. Now a little bit of background to John 4 as, as we get in to this. This is the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And there's a, a very important verse in chapter 4, verse 4. It's a small verse, but it speaks volumes. And he had to pass through Samaria. What do you mean it speaks volumes? We need to understand a little bit about culture. In John chapter 3, we see that Jesus was in Judea. And in chapter 4, he's, he's wanting to go to Galilee. Judea is in the southern part of Israel. Galilee is in the northern part of Israel. And to the west, you have the Mediterranean Sea. And to the east, you have the Jordan River. And wedged in between Galilee and Judea is Samaria. And what is the shortest distance between two points? A straight line. Well, you would think that you know, for, for me to get from Judea to Galilee, all I need to do is just make a straight line. But you're not Jewish. And you don't have Samaritans. See, the culture of that time, the Samaritans were despised and hated to the point that if I, wanted to, if I was a Jew and I wanted to go from Judea to Galilee, I am not going to go through Samaria. I'm going to go east across the Jordan River. I'm going to go north until I get to the point where I can cross back over into Galilee. It would be like, you know, um, let's say John wanted to talk to Wayne. right? And Wayne's over here on this side. And John says, well, you know what? These people in the middle, they're just strange. I'm not going to make a direct line to Wayne. What, what's, what's John going to do? He's going to go out that door. He's going to go out that door. And he's going to go all the way around. And he's going to come in those doors just to come up here and talk to Wayne because he doesn't want to see you guys. That's how ridiculous it was. That's the culture. Where did the Samaritans come from? The Samaritans came from that time when uh, Israel was taken captive by Assyria and there was intermarriage going on. And the offspring of Jews and Gentiles it, it landed in this area. Uh, they became Samaritans and they were despised. They were considered half-breeds. And what happened to the nation of Israel was uh, they became impure. And so you read in Ezra that they set up guidelines to where if you were not purely Jewish, you could not worship in the temple. You were just not allowed to be there. And so what happened then is the Samaritans, well, they said, well, since we can't worship there, we're going to create our own worship. We're going to create our own temple. And we're going to worship there. And they didn't accept the rest of Scripture. They stopped at the Pentateuch. That was their Scripture. That's all they believed. And they were not going to call anybody a prophet past Moses because they, they weren't going to accept it. That's what the Jews had. So we're just going to set up our rival worship. And that's where we find the context of this particular place. Jesus on His way, and He, he goes here intentionally because the Gospel needed to get to Samaria. Samaritans needed to hear it. And Jesus strikes up a conversation with a stranger. In that culture, a social outcast. Why? Because women didn't come to the well alone. So she was there alone because she was a social outcast. And Jesus had been confronting her, talking to her about living water, and confronting her about her lifestyle. And she was taken back to the fact that this Jewish man was talking to her. Jesus looked beyond all of that. He looked beyond all of that and He saw someone who needed the Gospel. He wanted to make sure that it was very clear that the Gospel is universal. The message of the Gospel is universal. He saw a person who needed to hear it. So let's pick up the story in John chapter 4, starting in verse 17. And I encourage you to go and read the whole context 
of this so you can really get the flow of what's happening. But for our focus here this morning, we're going to pick up in verse 17. Jesus had just told her to go call your husband. He just confronted her, and she said, I have no husband. Jesus said, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The Samaritan woman asked a question. And you know, many people look at this text and say, well, she doesn't like being confronted with her sin, so she's just changing the subject. You know, that could be true. That could be a reason. But I don't think that's the reason. Right? Because if you consider where she is, and she's at the point where she's close. She's close to understanding who Jesus is. She's close to understanding that what she's been doing is wrong. And, and if she's really going to worship God, she has to worship Him correctly. But she's in a quandary. Because the Jews say, I've got to go here to worship. And my people say, I've got to go here in worship. And, and we've got to do it this way. And the Jews say, we've got to do it this way. So what am I supposed to do, Jesus? How am I supposed to worship? So I think it's a legitimate question that comes out of her beginning to perceive that something is amiss. And so Jesus, He doesn't change the subject back. He goes on with it. And He gives us some important things to think through. Because the reason is, there was an epidemic of confusion about worship back then. And sadly, that epidemic has continued into today. There is a lot of confusion about where one should worship and about how one should worship. But all these things that people want to put into and expect out of worship. And so Jesus, in answering her question, provides insight into the non-negotiables of authentic worship. Worship is very important to Jesus and He makes it very clear as to what needs to be involved in worship. So our main point here this morning is this. Authentic worship. Okay, you're going to have to take over back there if you could please. Oh, okay. Technology is great when it works, right? So authentic worship only occurs when it's done God's way. Authentic worship only occurs when it's done God's way. And so what we're going to see here are four elements or four non-negotiables of authentic worship. So we want to answer the question here this morning, how can we ensure that our worship is authentic? How can we ensure our worship is authentic? Well, the first thing we, we need to understand is we need to remove all man-made presuppositions. We need to remove all man-made presuppositions. I know that's a big word. What does that mean? A pre and all of you have them. Okay? It's not a disease. Okay, it's, not, it's not a sickness. All right? Every single person in this room has a set of presuppositions. A presupposition is a belief, a pattern of thinking that we develop over time concerning certain issues. Everywhere you go, you're going to encounter someone who has presuppositions about almost everything. And some, of the, and some people aren't afraid to let you know what they are. Right? The Samaritan woman reveals the presuppositions about worship that were prevalent of her time. The presupposition was from the Samaritans, we're going to worship at Mount Gerizim, which is right there near the well where, where Jesus was meeting with her. All right? They saw that back in Genesis. As that's where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. So, so that's where we're to go. We're to worship there. The Jews said you've got to go to the temple. That's a presupposition. You've got to do this. You've got to do all of those are presuppositions as to what makes worship worship. We have them too. 
And we could go around the room here this morning and we could ask, what do you think authentic worship looks like? And I can guarantee you that you're going to get different answers from practically everybody. How will you know you've experienced authentic worship? Because you have a presupposition. You believe something to be true. See, growing up, I heard that you can't have drums in worship because truly godly music doesn't have a beat. If you know anything about music, all music has a beat. Right, Jeremy? Uh, just talk to our drummer. He'll tell you every song has a beat. But that's what I grew up with. The presupposition. In certain parts of our country, there are churches that use no instruments at all. Some who play, and I, I know this to be true too, some who play secular ACDC songs as people are coming in as a means of drawing the unbeliever into their worship. I don't know a lot of ACDC songs, but I can tell you, I'll, I'll let you think about what my thought is on that one. Um, there are some churches that have snake handling as part of their worship services. Some of you know of those churches where the belief is that you know, in the name of Jesus, we can handle poisonous snakes. They're, they're, if they bite us, we're not going to die. There are some who hold to that. Bunch of weirdos. Jumping up and down in place as part of worship. Barking like a dog as part of their worship. Casting out demons. Conducting healing services. And the list goes on and on. All in the name of authentic worship. And so, there are some presuppositions that we need to deal with from this text that probably some of you have. So we want to be able to deal with those the first one I think about here is, is the fact that you know, Jesus broke every external barrier to unite all believers into one body. How do I get that? We can't overlook the fact that Jesus went and talked to a non-Jewish woman. A social outcast. He broke all social norms to make sure that she understood the Gospel. Look at what Jesus says, starting in verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, th that's not a disrespectful term. Okay, that, Jesus didn't say that respectfully. Like, woman! That's not how He did it. He's like, this is a term of endearment. Woman, believe me. Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. An hour is coming, and now is. Jesus is speaking about His death and resurrection. And His point is this. He's inaugurating a new form of worship. Where authentic worshipers, and listen to this, authentic worshipers will be identified not by a particular place that they go to, but by their unified worship of the Father through Him. The externals aren't important. Ethnicity doesn't matter. Jews and Gentiles alike are united into one body. Whatever ethnic group we want to classify ourselves in, we can still unite together with people of other ethnic groups. Why? As the Holy Spirit is within us, we are united in Christ. Gender doesn't matter. Male and females are united together in Christ. Socioeconomic identity doesn't matter. Whether you're poor or rich, slave or free, that doesn't matter. It's an external that we've created to separate ourselves. I know this one's, gonna, this one's really going to rock some boats here. Denominational preferences do not matter. Denominational preferences do not matter. Did you know that denominations existed in the New Testament? Paul, in dealing with the church of Corinth, there were people who followed Paul. There are people who followed Peter. There are people who followed Paul. Why? Because there was a preference there. They, they liked what this person taught they, or they liked what this person did, so they followed. 
That's a denominational preference. That's a choice that they make. You follow a particular denomination based on what they practice or what they teach. So it doesn't matter if you're a member of the First Presbyterian, Baptocostal, Methodist, Holy Roller, Snake Handlers, Cowboy Church. None of that matters. See, the truth is, in every and get, I want you to hear this, and this includes here, okay? In every denomination, in every church, including here, there are authentic worshipers and there are fake worshipers. In every church. Why? Because Jesus demolished all man-made externals. So we have to understand that. Jesus demolished all of those. Okay, so, so we have to remove all of our presuppositions. Another one. The place of worship isn't important. The place of worship isn't important. True worshipers exist everywhere. Authentic worshipers are authentic because of not where they worship, but because of who they worship and because of the fact that Jesus Christ is part of their life. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in them. Gone are the days when worship was required in the temple. Those aren't anymore. When the veil was torn, when Jesus died, He, he, he entered into the most holy place and He made the, our presence able to be in there. Okay, we're able to enter the most holy place because of Jesus Christ. We can enter the very presence of God without being in any place. You can worship God in your car. You can worship God at home. Now, don't, don't say the preacher said, well, I don't have to be at church. God said, I, you know, we can worship. No, we need to be involved in, in corporate worship. But the place doesn't matter because you take the Holy Spirit with you wherever you go. Worship, and, and you need to listen to this one, worship it's not about what you get. It's what you give. Worship is about what you give. The word worship here simply means to give honor to. To give reverence. To see somebody as superior and honor them. In Scripture, the word is used indiscriminately. In other words, it's used to talk about people who bow down to idols people who will uh, lift up a king, an emperor. And it's also you to talk about those who genuinely worship God. So the word in itself is not a holy word. It just means that you're going to give honor to someone who you consider to be higher. Everyone worships. Even the atheist worships. Worships himself. Worships his, ide his, his ideologies. So everyone worships. God has put that in every heart, is to worship. But the common New Testament word for worship, which is the one that is used here, literally means to kiss toward. That's what it means, to kiss toward. And it came from the ancient custom of kissing the hand of the king, bowing down to prostrate yourself in front of them. So in a Christian context, we simply apply that to our God. We're bowing down and we're kissing the hand of God. We give Him glory. So essentially, worship is giving. We give God glory. So everything that happens here on Sunday morning is designed to be a catalyst that stimulates our desire to honor God, to give to Him something. So when you enter those doors on Sunday morning, when you enter into what we've labeled as the worship center, and we've labeled it that because this is where the corporate body gathers, right? So we've labeled it that way. Um, when we look at worship, it's not about what we get but what we give then when we come in we ought to be looking at how can i give to god today because we're giving ourselves and our heart and, and our possessions but see the sad truth is most people come or go to church based on what they're going to get there are some people who will church hop they'll, they'll look around and they'll, they'll see who's preaching that particular sunday or or who's who the guest speaker is or, or the musicians or whatever and they go to that church based on what they're going to get out of going to that church. Or the other side of the coin is maybe they're disappointed in the music. Maybe they're disappointed in the sermon. The sermon fell flat. And so they say, well, the sermon didn't do anything for me today. I didn't get anything out of worship. And you know what? I just, I just can't worship there. I just didn't get anything out of it. 
They made worship about getting, not giving. We're here to honor God, and that's giving, not getting. But here's something that's glorious. When we give, we often receive, don't we? When we give, we receive from God the blessing. So, so we come to worship to give, not to get. The last presupposition I want to deal with here this morning is worship is not about how it makes you feel. In verse 22, Jesus says, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Jesus is emphasizing the object of worship there. He's talking about who it is you're worshiping. See, the Samaritans rejected the rest of Scripture, and so their view of God was limited. And so what they did is they had a God of their own making. The Jews worshipped the God of the Bible, so to some degree they had it right, but they, they still were missing the bow. But at least they had the truth of the Scriptures. The object of your worship is of utmost importance. So many people in our time make worship about how it makes them feel at the moment. Expecting that emotional experience in worship becomes that driving force that what they do and what they look for is that good feeling or that, that closer to God feeling. And so what happens then is you begin to worship worship instead of worship the God of worship. As we were practicing this morning as a praise team, and this is something that we had to remind ourselves of, you know, it can be so easy for us as a praise team to get caught up in the how it looks and how it sounds that we forget about the God we are singing about. So how you know that the object is wrong is when your response is an unbiblical response. When your thoughts are turned towards what didn't happen or what you thought should happen instead of focusing on how can I praise my God? How does this reveal God to me? How does this reveal something about my heart towards God? All of those things ought to be geared towards God. So if your expectation of worship rises or falls based on the feelings you get from it, you've replaced God as your object. Now there are many more that we could talk about here this morning, but we just want to focus on those. I just want to challenge you with this question. What are your thoughts about worship? And are they biblical? Are your thoughts biblical? What are your expectations? So just to stop and think about it from that point of view. So a second element is this. We need to engage in worship with our whole heart. Engage in worship with your whole heart. Guys, you're, if, we're, if we're down, we'll just go ahead and turn the computer off if you could. Engage in worship with your whole heart. Look at verse 23. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Authentic worship begins internally. Authentic worship begins internally. The Greek is quite clear here. It doesn't say in the Spirit. It says in spirit. So Jesus is not talking about the Holy Spirit, although it, you really can't worship God unless the Holy Spirit indwells you. That's not what He's talking about here. He's talking about worshiping in the spiritual realm with the fullness of every part of who we are. That's the Spirit. Every part of who we are in contrast to just going through the external motions. So when we talk about worshiping God in spirit, it means that we are fully engaged with our heart, at the deepest level of who we are. Because if we're not fully engaged with everything of who we are, then all of those externals we do, they're worthless. They're worthless. Unless our heart is fully engaged. Because outward performance may or may not be worship. Spurgeon said, God does not regard our voices. He hears our hearts. And if our hearts do not sing, we've not sung at all. Sometimes we sing, but we don't worship. Sometimes we pray with our lips and worship doesn't take place. Sometimes we give and we're not worshiping. And then sometimes we do none of those and we're at the deepest part of worship. See, outward expressions don't necessarily mean a person is or isn't an authentic worshiper. 
They cannot determine that. So you could kneel at, at the most um, pristine chapel. You, you could listen to the most uh, eloquent preacher preach a, a marvelous message. You, you could get lost in the refrains of music at a Mercy Me concert or whoever it is that, that, you, that you like to listen to. You can do all of that and still not be worshiping. Not to say that externals aren't helpful, but it's the heart. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verses 6 to 8, and says, And by this you invalidated the Word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites! Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. You see the danger? We just sang songs honoring God with our mouths. But did you honor God with your heart? Worship is not about the songs we sing. It's not about the routines we go through. It's not about the things that we think we're doing in the name of Christ. What makes corporate worship a marvelous part of our life is that it's worship that comes from the heart. And we're united together with people who have that same heart that want to honor God. That's what it means to worship in spirit. See, it's possible for us to be gathered in this place and be faking it. Why are you faking it here this morning? Because worship transcends externals. The external expressions of worship are to reflect what's happening internally. That doesn't mean every Sunday you've got to have this red-hot zeal that makes you want to jump over the chairs and, and do all that extra stuff. That, that's not what we're saying. Because you could have come from a week that was just so hard and your heart struggles to worship, but you come to worship anyway because you recognize that God can handle my struggles. It's okay to come to worship with a burdened, heavy heart, realizing that I can't handle these on my own, but I can give them to the God who can. It's okay to say, God, I'm out of it. Bring me back. Give me a heart that... that learns and yearns for you. Increase my desire for you, God. It's okay to say, God, I'm confused. I don't understand what's going on in my life right now. But I trust you. I trust your sovereignty. I trust your wisdom. And although we don't focus on the external expressions, I do want to say this. It's okay for you to express yourself. And not to look around and say, well, what are they going to think of me? If you've gotten to that point, you have now replaced God as your object of worship. You've replaced your feeling, your fear of what others are going to say. And so if you feel like raising your hand when a song is sung, raise your hand. If you feel like saying amen when something is preached, say amen. It's okay for you to express yourself. That's what it means to have spirit. And I can tell you that in a lot of churches, They've swung the pendulum too far both ways. There, there are some churches where it's just out of control. And then there are other churches where people are like this. And they're afraid to raise their hand because so-and-so might think something different. Who cares what everybody else thinks? What does God think? Worship God in spirit. We need to be engaged also according to truth. Notice Jesus says, in spirit and in truth. Okay? And in truth. We need to be people of the Word. We need to be people of the Word. Truth means that we're going to worship what is true about God. And that occurs when we come together and we focus on God and our understanding is coming from the Scriptures. Not what I think it says, but what does it say? Revealing what God has said about Himself. And this is what He has revealed Himself through. He's revealed Himself through Christ and He's revealed Himself through the Word. Jesus said in John 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. This is the only way we can really know who God is is by studying His Word. And so what that means is that we don't have the right to determine who God is. Our culture doesn't have the right to determine who God is. That's why theology matters. 
Theology matters. You have the responsibility to make sure that the, the place where you choose to worship is teaching the truth of the Scriptures. And go after that. Is God's Word the final authority of all matters of faith and practice? You may not like all the other things that go on around, but are they teaching the truth? Are they holding to the truth? And that's why we spend a significant amount of time studying the Scriptures, going after the Scriptures, because this is the only rule of life that we have. And God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, and so we go after it. Like I said earlier, there's not one church that does it all right. There are things I'm sure that we don't do right by everyone's standards. But I can tell you from a leadership standpoint, we are sure trying to do our best to make sure we're, we are having authentic worship all the time. And we want you to know that whenever you come to church, that whoever is up here, it is on them to make sure they're teaching the Word of God in a consistent and powerful way. But it's your job to hold us accountable to that. So we need to make sure our view of God aligns with what He's revealed in His Word. See, every failure in worship or doctrine can be traced back to wrong thoughts about God. See, wrong thoughts about God were the source of Cain's failure. Remember Cain? And he, he brought to God a sacrifice, but it just gives a general description. It, it didn't give the description of it being the best. He had this view of God that he could come and worship him his own way. Have you done that here this morning? Have you come to worship here this morning thinking that you can just worship God however you want to? That's a wrong view of God. You have to worship God his way. Wrong thinking about God is in fact idolatry because it, it, it assumes God is other than who he is. Just because we don't bow down to physical images doesn't mean we're free from idolatry. Listen to Romans 1.21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him or give God thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their futile heart was darkened. See, some only see God as a cosmic force. He's just this force up in the sky and, and you know, yeah, he, I can take Him or leave Him. Right? That's how some people look at Him. So that there's a cold, icy reverence. And then you have the other end of the extreme where God is my pal. God is my buddy, buddy. And everything in religious life is essentially centered on me and what God can give me. It's like we view God as this cosmic genie or cosmic slot machine that instead of putting quarters in, if I just put in the right Scripture verse, then God will... Yep, God's going to give me what I want now. See, when we bring God down to our level of friendship and how we determine what a friend is, although the Scripture says God has made us His friend, our view of that friendship ought not to be He's a buddy, buddy, but that we are no longer His enemy. And when we've brought God down to our level of friendship, we've lost the awe and reverence of God that we need. We need to make sure that our view of God has been informed by the Scriptures. So we need to be people of the Word and we need to be people who think biblically. See, worship is not a mindless activity. It's not the, they're drinking the Kool-Aid. You guys remember that phrase? I know some of you young people won't remember that. But drinking the Kool-Aid, a guy by the name of Jim Jones, you know, they had this Kool-Aid that everybody drank and they died, right? The, the poison cyanide-filled Kool-Aid. That's not what we're about. See, worship is not about just going through mindlessly, right? We need to have mental interaction with the truth. Ephesians 4.23 says, and that you be renewed where? In the spirit of your mind. Jesus calls us to love Him. How? With all of our heart, all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2 I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I love Romans 8, 5-7. really speaks hard to this issue. 
For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. When your mind is set on flesh, you are not worshiping God. You're hostile. That's not worship. So that means that when we worship, we've got to have a mind that's set above. That we're thinking biblically about God and life. See, authentic worship requires both. Jesus doesn't give us an option. Well, I'm just going to go to worship and I'm going to worship God in spirit. Woo! Yeah. No. It doesn't say worship in spirit or truth or truth or spirit. What does he say? He says, and truth and spirit. See, worship without truth is dangerous. See, worship without truth is dangerous because then we're held captive by our emotions and we're focused on what we want and what we desire. Our view of worship is relegated to how we feel that day. And then we begin to accept all forms of worship based on, oh, I, I want to do this or I want to do that. And it doesn't fit the way God wants to be worshipped. But see, worship without spirit is equally dangerous because it makes our heart cold and not willing to listen to what God says and, and to have a heart that, that is drawn to Him. We're indifferent to the reality of God's work and worth in our lives. So without a heart that is turning to Christ, we fight against the way God wants us to live. So we have to have spirit and truth. Because when we do that, we have the fourth element, which is making Christ-centered worship a priority. He says... Verse 23, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. This is not in the sense that we make ourselves worshipers. That we're worthy of God and that He He is wanting me to, uh, to be a part of His elite group of worshipers. That's not what Jesus is saying here. It's in the sense that God is intensely going after His people. God is intensely yearning to make them the kind of people whose hearts are ready to worship Him, to pour themselves out to Him. It's God taking the initiative to develop people who want to worship Him, who want to glorify Him, who want to give others the right opinion of God. And it only happens when our life is found in Christ alone. You can't be an authentic worshiper of God here this morning if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You're faking it. You're faking it. And so when our life is found in Christ alone and we really want to be those authentic worshipers that God seeks after, then we look for opportunities in our heart to proclaim His goodness. To proclaim Him. Because you see, the central reality in worship is this. God seeks us. We don't seek Him as we ought. So what that means is that we need to be intentional about our worship. Don't just go through the motions. Be intentional. Zephaniah 3, verse 17 says this, The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in His love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. That's God's words to you. He's rejoicing over you with joy. God makes us a priority. Should we not make Him ours? So as we leave this place here this morning, I want to wrap it up in this. There's a lesson for us here in that there's nothing more important than what you think about God and how you worship Him. What the writer of Ecclesiastes says, the chief end of man is to what? Glorify God. Nothing else matters. Authentic worshipers. John's going to go on to tell us that this woman would eventually become saved and many more Samaritans would believe. So I, I ask you here this morning, if you're here without Christ, are you faking worship? You need, you need to come to 
come to realization that you need Christ. There's no other way. For you as a believer, is your worship lacking truth? Is your worship lacking spirit or both? What steps do you need to take today to make sure you're worshiping God in spirit and in truth? That you are an authentic worshiper. Let's ask for God's help. Lord, thank you for your word here this morning. And Lord, I pray that we will evaluate our hearts and and we will truly examine how we worship. And that we'll lay aside all those expectations we have and, and, and we'll come to the place where we worship you your way. Challenge us with these words here this morning. If anyone does not know you, I pray today would be the day where they come.